Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Tracy, (laughs) this episode was supposed to be another installment of eponymous food. Yeah, it went a different way, though. It is not. It is little... Uh, But as I got into the story of one of those foods, it really unfurled quite quickly into a much bigger and much more important story about the family of a man who cultivated lettuce in his later life. Just as a heads up, I promise there's another eponymous food coming at some point, but it's not today. Um, This story is, I think, really important because it offers a snapshot of a very rich person's choice to emancipate his enslaved workforce the way his family received that information, and how their legacy, both good and bad, is all tied to having enslaved people building their familial wealth. Uh, Heads up, we're going to read a lot from writings that were composed in the 1800s, so of course, some of the language there is a bit outdated. Uh, But first, we're going to talk about Bib Lettuce and the man who cultivated it. Yes. I love it when episodes go in totally different directions from what they were planned. Just a hard left. (laughs) So John Bigger Bibb was born on October 27th, 1789 in Prince Edward County, Virginia. His parents, Richard Bibb and Lucy Booker Bibb, moved from Virginia to Kentucky when John was about nine years old. We're going to get back to Richard in a moment and talk about him a lot more. They shifted around Kentucky for a bit. First, they lived in Fayette County and then in Bullitt, where Richard Bibb purchased a salt works. Then they went to Logan County and established a large and successful farm. Bibb's early education was largely under Joshua Fry. That was a fellow Virginian who had moved to Mercer County, Kentucky. Fry's a pretty interesting figure in Kentucky history because when he moved there, he didn't think there was an adequate educational system, so he opened up a school out of his house, and then a lot of prominent people in Kentucky's history were educated by Joshua Fry. After his primary education, John Bibb studied law under Judge H.P. Broadnax. But before he could get his law career underway, the War of 1812 began, and the 23-year-old Bibb joined the 4th Kentucky Volunteer Brigade. He began as a private and was promoted to the rank of major after the Battle of Thames in October of 1813. Although the war continued into 1815, John Bibb was discharged just a month after his promotion and returned to Kentucky. And it's a little unclear, at least in the documents that I had available to me, why he was discharged so soon after being made major. It very well might have been a health issue, though. This is supported by the fact that although he passed the bar right after returning to Kentucky and opened his practice, he closed it down just a couple years later in 1816 due to poor health. In 1827, Bibb ran for a seat in the Kentucky House of Representatives as a Whig and won. He was re-elected in 1828 and then ran for the Kentucky Senate, won again. He served in the state Senate for four years from 1830 to 1834. During that time, he also married Sarah P. Horsley. Their wedding was on August 24th of 1831. Bibb was an amateur horticulturalist, and in 1845, he purchased land to support his hobby. He built his home, Gray Gables, on a property in Frankfort, Kentucky, on Wapping Street. That's usually touted as he built it for his wife. And it included a large greenhouse, and there was a substantial garden. And today, that's known as the Bibb Burnley House, and it has a historical marker. And it was there that he started working with lettuce. Over time. Bibb developed something he called limestone lettuce. It was a lettuce that grew well in Kentucky's limestone-rich soil. It was naturally resistant to a number of pests, including plant lice. It's also really tender, and it grows in a pretty compact head. And Bibb was not cultivating this crop for profit. He gave most of it away. And it actually was not renamed Bibb lettuce and commercially sold until decades after his death, which happened in 1884. He had, during his late lifetime, given away both lettuce and seeds. That was in the latter half of the 19th century. And subsequently, area farmers had started growing limestone lettuce for themselves. In 1919, the Green Wine Greenhouse of Louisville was the first to sell the lettuce with the name Bibb attached to it. 
So that's the pretty benign story of where bib lettuce came from. Now we have to take a look at the deeper legacy of slavery within the bib family and John B. Bibb's role within that. To do that, we have to go back to his father, Richard Bibb. So there's a historical marker outside of Major Richard Bibb's townhouse in Russellville, Kentucky. It was placed there by the Kentucky Historical Society in 1975, and that marker reads, quote, Bibb, a Revolutionary War soldier, was born in Virginia, 1752. He came to Lexington, Kentucky in 1798, moved to Logan County the next year where he built Bibb's chapel, later erected this house for his wife. Major Bibb freed 29 of his slaves in 1829 and sent them to Liberia. He died in 1839, and his will provided for the release of his other slaves and gave them land. Here's the more detailed story. Richard was born in Goochland County, Virginia, on April 13, 1752. His parents were John Bibb and Susanna Bigger Bibb, and during the Revolutionary War, Richard joined the Continental Army and rose to the rank of major. When Richard moved his family to Kentucky, he brought with them a large number of enslaved people. He had actually been the second largest slaveholder in Prince Edward County, Virginia. In 1817, the American Colonization Society was formed in the U.S. Its goal was to provide an alternative to emancipation within the U.S. for Black enslaved people, the the option of being shipped to Africa. This has come up in several previous episodes, most recently in our episode on Paul Cuffey, there were supporters of this idea who believed that it would truly be a viable option for free Black people. There were also people who just saw this as a solution from a racist standpoint. It would get those free Black people out of the United States. Both abolitionists and pro-slavery white people used similar rhetoric about free Black people never truly assimilating into white society. So for the pro-slavery crowd, this was seen as a condition of emancipation. The emancipated person would then leave the country. Did not matter if they had been born and raised in the United States and had no real ties to Africa at this point. And Major Richard Bibb, so again, Lettuce, John Bibb's father, had at some point in his later life realized that the institution of slavery was wrong. This was a position that is usually attributed to his religious studies and becoming a minister. There are some versions of his life story that indicate that one of the people that he enslaved had been the one to encourage him to become a Methodist minister after he had initially been on a path to be an Episcopalian minister. And he had connections to the American Colonization Society. He was friends with Henry Clay, who was one of the society's founders. Richard eventually decided that the plan to relocate emancipated Black people to Africa was a good idea. So in 1829, he announced that he was emancipating one-third of his enslaved workforce on the condition that they would be sent to Liberia. There is a little bit of fractured logic about why only one-third were going to be manumitted, and it's sometimes cited as Major Bibb's reasoning here. He had just short of 100 enslaved people working for him in 1829. Some of those were entire families, self-contained within the Bibb family's holdings. But many were married to enslaved people who were owned by other families. So, According to this logic, he selected 31 that no other white family could claim ownership over, believing that that would be better than breaking up families. Yes, there is some logic to that, but it also conveniently ignores the fact that Major Bibb almost certainly possessed the wealth to purchase and manumit any number of enslaved people had he wanted to keep families together. The one exception to this whole scenario was a man named Richard Morton. He had been owned by Bibb's son-in-law, Dr. Bonarogas Roberts, and he was married to a woman named Hannah who was part of Major Bibb's enslaved workforce. According to a number of accounts, the enslaved people that Bibb selected were ones who also wanted to go to Liberia rather than remain enslaved, although there is no way to verify that, and sometimes it reads very conveniently in retellings of this story. We're going to talk about the only account of Bibb's emancipation of an announcement by a person who was there in just a moment. First, though, we'll pause for a quick sponsor break. So 
there is an account of that announcement that this group of enslaved people would be emancipated, and it is the only firsthand account that we have. It is not without problems, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, This account was given by a formerly enslaved man named Andrew Bibb, who related to a reporter in late 1897. Andrew would have been 73 at the time, and he would have been five in 1829 when the events that he recounted took place. And we're going to read this account, but before we do, please know that it is really very romanticized. It puts Major Bibb in a very, very kind light. So this account reads in part, quote, In the center of the yard stood an old gentleman with uplifted hands, and beside him was a barrel on end, on top of which was placed a Bible and a hymn book. In front and around him were nearly 100 slaves. Twenty-nine of these were about to start as free men and women in the land of their fathers in far-off Africa after several generations of servitude in America. The old man asked a divine blessing upon them. Since his youth, he had cared for them, and before that, they or their parents had belonged to his father. He believed slavery was wrong and was taking the initial step toward putting into execution a long-cherished plan. He was about to send one-third of his slaves to Liberia, the others he intended to liberate at his death. He had read a chapter in the Bible and had given out a hymn And when his prayer was finished, many a black face was bathed in tears, and the slaves gathered about and shook old master's hand for the last time and heard the accent of his kindly voice. This goes on to say that the people chosen for the journey were, quote, shiftless and refractory, obstinately resistant to authority or control, unruly. So that last quote, of course, contradicts the framing that Bibb was selecting the people who wanted to go to Africa. So Andrew Bibb's story was published in the Courier Journal of Louisville, Kentucky. It was written by a reporter named M.B. Morton. Sometimes this story, as it's relayed, is uh, told as though it's a direct quote from Andrew. I don't think that was ever the intention. It's a direct quote of M.B. Morton about the story as told to him. And we don't know if the account was edited or altered, although it certainly seems likely I I don't know anybody who speaks in such prosy, t- you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like there's nobody. Um, M.B. Morton, we should say, kind of made a career out of talking about slave narratives. He went on to write extensively about Kentucky's enslaved population, including in a book he wrote called Kentuckians Are Different. That didn't come out until 1938, so almost 40 years later. That's also a book that he dedicated to the state's enslaved population as his educators. So there's a lot to unpack there. I just want to acknowledge sort of what was going on with it. We do know that it took several years for the plan to move all of those people to actually be executed. They were taken to Clarksville, Missouri by wagon, then boarded a steamship for New Orleans. In New Orleans, they were taken aboard a brig called the Ajax, on April 20th, 1833. The oldest member of the group Bibb sent was a man in his 30s named Andrew, and the youngest was just a little over six months old. All of them, according to research done by Michael Morrow, museum director for the Seek Museum that now exists on Bibb's former property, all the people Bibb emancipated for this journey were the direct descendants of enslaved people known by the names Lucy and Keziah. That couple had been enslaved by the Bibb family going all the way back to Virginia. We also don't know exactly why it took two and a half years to get them onto this ship after the announcement. That's all a little unclear in these retellings, and there doesn't seem to be, like, a journal or anything kept by any of, like, the wagon drive, anybody that explains why that took two and a half years. Even then, that seems like an extraordinarily long time. Uh, The voyage of the Ajax was paid for with funding from the American Colonization Society and the Kentucky Colonization Society. And in addition to Lucy and Keziah's family from the Bibb properties, there were 118 other enslaved people being emancipated through this journey. They were mostly from Kentucky. There was also a white missionary and an agent of the Tennessee Colonization Society named H.D. King. This journey was really rough. There was a cholera outbreak on the ship, which killed several dozen people. Those numbers are usually uh, quoted as between 30 and 40, but it's not 100% clear. 
A Black minister named Abel Long visited Liberia years later, and he reported that he was unable to make contact with any of the people from the Bib group, although he was told that two of the women had survived and had gone into the jungle to live. That account is very strange. I read it in one newspaper, and it, it's also very sensationalized. There's language I did not care to include here. The rest of the people who went appeared to have died. When Major Bibb died, as was indicated on that historical marker we mentioned earlier, he did, as promised, emancipate his remaining enslaved workforce. He once again indicated a desire for some of them to go to Liberia, and he also offered an alternate plan. Here's the pertinent passage from his will. Quote, I do hereby emancipate all of my slaves from and after the first day of January next, after my death, and desire that all of them who have not wives or husbands in bondage be sent to Liberia. I give to my slaves hereby emancipated $5,000 to be divided out among them and paid out to them from time to time, according to the discretion of my executors. And all of my stock of horses, cattle, sheep, and hogs, farming tools, wagons, and carts, and crops made the year of my decease, or that may be on hand, and each slave hired out to the hire due for the year in which I shall decease. I also give to said slaves all my lands, which are unsold or undisposed of in the county of Grayson of this state, The land in the county of Logan, conveyed to me by Benjamin Tompkins, Ralph E. Norse, and Robert Norse, is to be divided among them at the discretion of my executors, and also the land in Logan, conveyed to me by Mark Harden, and about 30 acres adjoining it. Conveyances to be made by my executors, or either of them. And they are hereby authorized to sell and convey any of the land or either property hereby given to my emancipated slaves, and divide or lay out the money for their benefit. I give to my Aaron the house and lots on which he lives in Russellville, and his carpenter tools as his portion of the legacies left my emancipated slaves. I give to my woman Clarissa's biz that part of most remote from the dwelling house to include the Smith's shop. Major Bibb then included a long list of names of the emancipated enslaved. They are listed only by first name. This part of the will then concludes with, quote, I give to my slaves by this will emancipated my two lots under the knob near M.B. Morton's and two fractional lots in Saunders addition to Russellville near James Bell's stable and a fractional lot near William Duncan's and William First's near the public square to be divided and conveyed to them at the discretion of my executors. When Major Bibb died, his son John wrote two letters to his older brother, George M. Bibb, who had been a U.S. senator and was serving as a judge of the Jefferson County Court of Chancery when their father died. The first letter informed George of the major's passing, and then the second asked for George's thoughts on the will because George's expertise in wills and trusts was just unmatched. George's response was 12 pages long, and he did not agree with his father's wishes, but he also knew he couldn't really contest the will, although the advice that he gives to his brother is not in the interest of the people that Major Bibb named for emancipation. We're not going to read this whole thing. Again, it is 12 pages long. That would be the whole podcast, really. (laughs) Uh, We'll read some excerpts of it, though, to show how George Bibb made the case to his brother that he could hang on to assets that were mentioned in the will for as long as possible. Yeah, this... mm, I have feelings about this letter. Uh, George's letter opens with some niceties towards John, discusses that their father has died, and early on it includes this passage, quote, What effect the experiment our father has made in sending Negroes to Liberia and in setting out some to work for themselves near him might have had in changing his mind upon the subject of emancipation, I did not know. The will which he has left shows that his mind was unaltered. It is done. Poor as I am, struggling at my time of life, by the most intense application to the duties which does not afford any surplus at the year's end above the expenses of my family, Yet I would not, for the property bequeathed by the will, for all the Negroes, nor the value ten times told, insult the memory of our father by and attempt to set aside the writing 
he has published as his last will and testament. Whoever suggested an intention on my part to oppose the will or to endeavor to break it did but little understand my thoughts or temper, spoke at random without color of authority from me, and did me great injustice. At this point in his life, George had enjoyed a lot of success, but he had, for reasons that are kind of nebulous, gotten to the point where his finances were pretty lean by the time his father died. The only reasons he cites when discussing his financial problems were the banking system and, quote, my own confiding temper. So while you might understand his dismay at his father giving so much land and money toward his emancipation provisions and why people expected that he would try to contest the will, it's also reported that Major Bibb left his children well cared for financially. It was even mentioned in his death announcement. Yeah, I'm always suspicious of anyone who's like, even though I am in the worst position, I would never try to do anything. Like, when that's your open, I'm going to lean back. Um, Aside from insisting that he would never insult his father's memory, George makes his opinions pretty clearly known in this letter about how he believes the will should be executed. And we are going to dig into all of that after we first take a little break and hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History class going. George Bibb makes clear in his letter that he believed his father was wrong in emancipating slaves. He did not side with abolitionists. This writing is, for me, infuriating to read, and it includes the following, quote, The emancipation of a large number of Negroes, male and female, helpless and infirm, old and young, would provide a nuisance to society as well as an injury to the Negroes. And he hints that the key to managing the situation in the way he thinks would avoid problems is in the executor's hands. Although he also adds, quote, the extent of discretionary powers given to his executors is not clear of difficulty. So remember, George Bibb was an expert in wills. He had practiced law, he was able to build a case, and as he continues with this, it definitely seems like he's trying to show his brother John that there is just so much gray area in the will when it comes to the specifics of the apportionment. So he continues, quote, to apply these rules to the will, I give to my slaves hereby emancipated $5,000 to be divided out amongst them and paid out to them from time to time according to the discretion of my executors, the extent of the discretion which the executors are to exercise under the clause respects, first, the division amongst these collegiaries, second, the time of the payments. The important question is, may the executors divide the money in unequal shares? If the shares are to be equal, share and share alike to each legatory. If the executors cannot exercise a discretion by giving five shillings to one and eighty dollars to another from time to time, graduated by the incapacities, families, and infirmities which enter into the question of the respective abilities or inabilities to labor for self-support, There, the sentence would be no more operative by the presence of those words divided out amongst them than if those were expunged and the testament left with the words to be paid to them from time to time according to the discretion of my executors. By denying a discretionary power to the executors to make the division amongst the collegiaries in unequal portions, the one member of the sentence would be made expletive with no effect whatever, contrary to the rule that every word shall have effect if consistent with the other parts of the testament. After this, George invoked a 1794 law that Kentucky had passed regarding provisions for emancipating enslaved people. That law stipulated that anyone trying to manumit an enslaved person had to, quote, writing under his or her hand and seal, attested and proved in the county court by two witnesses. That paperwork had to be filed with the court, and the, quote, court shall have full power to demand bond and sufficient security of the emancipator, his or her executors or administrators, as the case may be, for the maintenance of any slave or slaves that may be aged or infirm, either of body or mind, to prevent their becoming chargeable to the county. 
So in short, if someone wanted to manumit a person, they had to promise and make provisions to ensure that the manumitted person would not become a burden on the state. George wrote of the law and reminded his brother John that this responsibility fell to him as executor and that it cost money just to file the paperwork. He noted that for every certificate of emancipation, the law authorizes the clerk to charge a fee of five shillings. Then he reminds his brother that there are 54 people named in the will for emancipation. Yeah, you can see him building his case. Like, this is a huge burden on you. We got to protect you. Uh, And he follows up by trying to show John that maybe their father really didn't think the money part through in other ways, writing, quote, But then again, in another part of the Testament, to each slave hired out, the hire due for such slave for the year ensuing the death of the testator is specifically devised to that slave, which shows the equality of legacies to each slave emancipated was not in the mind or will of the testator. But that emancipation was the general object of the will and not the fund of money, as well as the lands placed at the discretion of his executors, was not for the purpose of equality of legacies to each slave, but an absolute and unconfined discretion to be exercised by his executors for support of the many, according to circumstances, such as he himself would have exercised if he, in this lifetime, would have emancipated them, and come under the positive engagement to the courts to keep them from becoming a charge to the county. Next, George Bibb warns John that being the executor of their father's fortune is going to bring out the worst in people, adding, quote, you and your brother Richard are to have some trouble in the execution of the trust, in all probability, by reason of the interference of low-minded ignorance and interested knavery by persons who will stimulate the Negroes and speculate upon their interests in poverty. If you do not have so such, you are fortunate above the condition of society here in Louisville. Then he talks about how the funds have to be carefully managed in a way that ensures that all the desires of the testator have been met as the executor sees best, and that if all the assets are distributed, then the executor is left on the hook for any additional funds that are needed because of any emancipated people aging or no longer being able to work, because that's an injustice. He literally uses that word. This all sums up to a man urging his brother to not distribute everything, but instead to hold the funds in reserve to manage and dole out over time. The implication here is that the emancipated people wouldn't handle the money they were given properly, and then the Bibb family would be on the hook to make good financially with the county and state. He spells this out pretty clearly in this passage. Quote, The time of payment and applications of the sum of $5,000 specifically denoted being left by the will uncertain to be judged by the executors, according to the circumstances, the executors cannot be chargeable for interest unless for manifest delay and abuse contrary to the trust. If the executors exercise the power of selling the land, such funds so raised as shall not be divided or intended to be divided in their discretion, presently after received, ought to be put out to interest until such division shall become proper. We're going over this document and quoting it so closely because it's an important example of how anti-abolitionists could make a case that it was in everyone's best interests not to give enslaved Black people full emancipation or assets, even when it was somebody's will that they do so. It's also important because it informed decisions that shaped an entire community and in ways that are still felt today. John B. Bibb did take in this letter, uh, and he did start manumitting his father's enslaved workforce in waves starting in February of 1840. It was about a month after that emancipation was supposed to start, according to the will. The first group was 10 people. They went as a group to the Logan County Courthouse for their freedom papers, and they did get them. And these were followed by additional groups. 
None of the emancipated people chose to go to Liberia. Many of them moved to the land that had been set aside for them in Major Bibb's will. It's an area that became known as Bibb Town. That's actually two communities, Upper Bibb Town and Lower Bibb Town. But even so, the actual deeds to those lands were not fully granted until the late 1870s, so nearly 40 years after Major Bibb had died. Presumably, some of those people that had been emancipated had died in that interim 40 years. Other people left the area and moved to larger cities like Louisville or out of the state entirely. And it's important to remember that even once those who stayed had been emancipated and were living on land that had been set aside by Major Bibb, even if they didn't own that land outright, these were still free Black people living in a slave state before the Civil War. It was not safe for them. There was always a risk of being re-enslaved or being targeted with violence. And we have to go back to the lettuce. Because in having been left very comfortable when his father passed, John B. Bibb was able to have leisure time with which to cultivate his plants and develop that limestone lettuce. Listen, no shade to Bibb lettuce. I like it. Uh, But that inheritance that afforded all of that was possible due to the work of the hundreds of enslaved people his father had owned over the years and who had worked on his land, enabling him to amass a huge amount of wealth. Major Bibb is often cited as one of the richest men in Kentucky. Today, Major Bibb's home is a museum, the Seek Museum, which stands for Struggles for Emancipation and Equality in Kentucky. It's actually spread out among six buildings on two sites. The buildings have been restored, and the museum's mission is to tell the stories of the enslaved people emancipated by Major Richard Bibb. In 2019, there was a reunion at that museum, and anyone who was related to Bibb, both black and white, was invited to attend. And that's because it is highly likely and widely believed that some of the enslaved children on the Bibb property prior to Major Bibb's death had absolutely been fathered by him. There are quite a few articles written about that reunion. A lot of them are very feel-good. But I would recommend one by journalist Linnea O'Neill, which was written for the site Anscape, and it's titled The Bitter Harvest of Richard Bibb, A Descendant of Slavery Confronts Her Inheritance. It is a very frank piece of writing about the pain of such scenarios, things like this big feel-good reunion for some of the Black attendees. There's another reunion planned this fall. It's 2022. This is in September for Bibb's Descendants. And there will be a new documentary debuted at that one titled Invented Before You Were Born, which examines the issues of the Bibb story and its legacy. And you can get more information about that at seekmuseum.org. That's S-E-E-K museum.org. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, eh, not about lettuce. Sort of about lettuce. I just, it's one of those things where you realize, like, oh, this this cute story about food is really about the people that made it possible for a white guy to have leisure time to make that food. I'm going to switch gears pretty significantly for our listener mail because I need it. Uh, these, I have two listener mails, but they are both about our uh, Sir Sanford Fleming and time zone discussion. The first one is from our listener, Grace, who writes, Hi, Holly and Tracy. I'm sure you've gotten many emails from the Haligonians about our park, which was donated to us by Fleming. As an aside, I did not know that that's what people from Halifax called themselves, and I'm in love with it. <laughs> um Going back to Grace's letter, unfortunately, it is known by the name of the tower which now sits in it, the Dingle Tower. Yes, I am ready to tell you that the land which used to have the Fleming's Cottage on it is now known as the Dingle, occasionally the Dingle Park. Is this necessary knowledge to have of Halifax? Probably not, but I have oodles of cousins from Ontario who ask about the park just so they can giggle when I name it. If you have not been to Halifax, I highly recommend. It's a lovely little city, and you can hardly tell it exploded over 100 years ago. We have a natural history museum, which has a tortoise named Gus, who is 99 years old. He is turning 100 this year. She gives us Gus's webpage. Uh, I bet if you do a search for Nova Scotia and Gus, you'll find it. Our Museum of the Atlantic is fairly interesting, and they have some boats on display in the harbor, including my grandfather's old schooner, Hebride, which was built by the same shipbuilder as the Blue Nose. I have attached some photos of Clara, my cat. She is 13 years old and has been on a weight loss journey. I have attached a photo of her sleeping and performing tub inspection. Still not sure if I passed on that one. Um, 
This is so great, Grace. I love this because, one, it made me think about, uh, you know, if you go to Ireland, there's a Dingle Peninsula and lots of things called Dingle, and it is very fun to say. Uh, Two, this makes me want to go to Halifax, but probably when it's warm only because I don't handle cold. And three, I am in love, in love with Clara. Uh, She's a gray tuxedo, which is one of my very favorite things in the world, and she's beautiful. She's perfect just as she is, although no. I understand. I have had cats on weight loss journeys as well. Um, she's so beautiful. I love her. Uh, thank you for sharing her with us and your story. And the other one is from our listener, Kristen, who says, uh, Hi, Holly and Tracy. I'm writing as a fan of your podcast, who was delighted to hear the Canadian Institute make an appearance on your episode about time zones and Sir Sandford Fleming. I thought you might be interested to learn that the Canadian Institute that Sir Sandford helped found in 1849 is still an active organization, one of the oldest societies in Canada. It gained a royal charter in 1851 and has been known as the Royal Canadian Institute since the early 1900s, and more recently as RCI Science. It presents public science events across across Canada and still publishes a magazine. I had the great privilege of working with the Institute as its executive director and had a lot of fun helping to manage its archive. I bet that archive is amazing. Uh, There were a lot of interesting characters associated with RCI science beyond Sir Sanford, in particular Captain John Henry Lefroy, who spearheaded establishing the Toronto Magnetic Observatory. His life is fascinating. Um... Maybe he will be a a, a future podcast subject, so I'm not going to read all these other details. Uh, she also mentions Henry Holmes Croft as another character uh, who is a chemist who developed forensic techniques to investigate blood and poisons. I love that. Uh, and some more details to show hide because maybe, you know, uh, we'll talk about him. I think he came up in a previous podcast episode by prior hosts. But she goes on to say, if you're interested, there's more info on the two characters below. And there are many, many more, of course. I love your podcast. Thanks for including a lot of scientific history. It's fascinating. And great job on the Time Zone episode. Sir Sanford would not have found anything to quibble about. I doubt it just because I'm a doubter of things. But Kristen, Kirsten, I think I called you Kristen. It's Kirsten. Kirsten, thank you so much. Or maybe she's a Kirsten. Those names always get a little different. People like to say them differently. I have so many Kristens in my life that I love very much that it's hard not to default to that. So my apologies. Um, I love both of those emails. And I love, I love, I love that that organization is still doing amazing things and producing a magazine. So thank you both for sharing with us. I'm going to think about Clara a lot today because she's so cute. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if you would like to write to us, you could do so at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History, and you can subscribe if you haven't gotten to that quite yet. That's easy enough to do on the iHeartRadio app or anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.